Welcome to Leadership Reimagined on True Chat, where game-changing conversations are reshaping the world of work. Here's your host, Janice Ellig. Hello, and thank you for tuning in. I'm Janice Ellig, CEO and founder of Ellig Group, Executive Search Advisors, where we are reimagining search. I'm very excited to welcome our special guest, Maggie Wilderotter, an exceptional leader to speak on a topic where she is a true expert, reimagining CEO and board leadership. Maggie's corporate career included an outstanding decade-long track record as CEO of Frontier Communications, where she grew revenues from $1 billion to over $10 billion. Her achievements are particularly notable given she succeeded in the male-dominated telecommunications industry where women were and are still underrepresented in the C-suite and in the boardroom. Maggie has served on 32 public and private boards starting at the age of 28, where very few women held board seats at that age and time. And even today, women hold only 21% of seats on the S&P 500. Today, she serves on the public company boards of Cadence Design Systems, Giovanni, Costco, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and she chairs the DocuSign board. And private companies include Ardent Health, Cake Bread Cellars, Tanium, and the Lift Board. Maggie and her husband, Jay, own and run Wilderotter Vineyard and Grand Reserve Inn, and I can attest it is a fabulous inn. A remarkable career as CEO, board director, including working with startups and as an entrepreneur business owner. We have so much to cover and so much to learn, so let's get started. So Maggie, tell us some of your very early leadership lessons you learned growing up as Maggie Sullivan. Hi, Janice, and it's uh, such a pleasure to be here with you for this podcast. I've had um, the blessing of growing up in a household, all girls. Uh, My father and mother taught all of us that your education matters, uh, service to others matter, Uh, always doing your personal best, and that there's no such thing as failure. You just haven't figured it out yet. Um, I also think that we grew up in a household where my father would apply business principles to how he raised us. A good example is every Saturday, we would have a job jar that had our chores for the week, and we had to complete those chores in order to get our allowance the following Saturday. We were also allowed to trade our jobs and to negotiate with each other. Uh, on whether we were going to do that specific job or wanted to hand it off to a sister in exchange for something else. Um, And we were paid for performance that way. So those are just some anecdotes of how our parents raised us, um, I believe, to be comfortable in the business world. The last thing is my father worked in the telecommunications space, and um, he would commute from New Jersey, the Jersey Shore, into New York. And when he would get home at night, which was usually around seven, uh, my older sister, Denise, and I would have our homework done. We were already fed and we would sit at the dinner table with him every night and he would tell us about his day at work. Um, And so he really took a lot of that mystery out of work and what it meant. And he was very candid and honest with us of different things he was working on. Uh, And in the 60s, my father would take Denise and I to work once or twice a year with him. So we, we were doing take your daughters to work way before it was Vogue. So did he actually bring products home and ask you for like your input on product design? Is that one of the things that you did around the table talking with your dad? Yes. You know, an interesting story. My father worked for AT&T and he was the head of marketing at the company. And he invented uh, specific products like three-way calling. Um, He invented the touch-tone phone. Hmm. Uh, He, at one point, had brought home a phone for Denise and I to check out called the Princess Phone, which was a streamlined touch-tone phone that could go in a bedroom. I remember. For for young girls. Mm -hmm. And the phone he brought home was black. And my sister Denise and I looked at him, we said, Dad, if it's a princess phone, it has to be powder blue or pink, (laughs) not black. And they did. They actually changed the colors and- I had one. Off to the races. (laughs) Right. So you might might mention Denise ran Campbell Soup. So two daughters running major companies, great lessons learned early on in the family around the 
the the uh, table, right? Yeah, absolutely. Denise and I are are thirteen months apart. Uh, she's older, so I never let her forget that. But uh, she and I were both blessed because we grew up together, not just in our formative years, but also in our business years. And I'm very proud of my sister who ran Campbell Suit for, for six years as CEO uh, simultaneously when I was running Frontier Communications. So for about a, a four to five year window, we overlapped. Uh, and we were the only two siblings that ran Fortune 500s in the United States. So uh, hats off to my mother who calls herself Mother Superior. I think that she has the right to do that, <laughs> and so does your father. Wow, that's quite a family story. Uh, you also talked about giving back to the community, and that was really instilled in you early on. I think at the age of eight or nine, you also participated in a, a telethon, the Jerry Lewis. I remember those as well. Uh, you reached out to some high-powered people, I think even the White House. What did you do there? <laughs> Maggie, this is <laughs> it's true. We networked early on, Maggie. That's true. My sister and I used to have the Jerry Lewis telethon carnivals in our backyard where we would have lots of games set up for pennies a piece. And every year we would raise our money and uh, and my my folks, we would give them our money and my folks would write a check and we would send it off. Uh, and that did teach us how to give back. So when I was in seventh grade, um, I was actually uh, not just um, the president of my class, but I was a member of the city council representing students in junior high and high school on the city council. And it was during the Vietnam War. There were two Vietnam vets that came back to Long Branch, New Jersey, where I grew up, that had lost either one or both legs in Vietnam. And the city was holding a fundraiser for their families. And all members of the city council were required to sell tickets to the fundraiser. So I sat down and said, you know, I need to sell some tickets. I think President Nixon, since he's the president and it's happened on his watch where these two young men got hurt, that he and his wife should come to the dinner that we were hosting, the fundraising dinner. So I sent four tickets to the White House in an envelope with a note handwritten note from me. And I let them know that I was in school. So if they had any questions, they could contact me at Long Branch Junior High School. And I left the number for the school. So about two weeks later, I'm sitting in math class and <laughs> someone walks in and Mr. Er, my math teacher says, Maggie, the White House is on the phone for you downstairs. So of course I knew what it was. I go down to the front office, the principal, the vice principal, all the teachers who weren't in class at that moment were all there. I pick up the phone and it's some young staffer from the White House, uh, probably wasn't much older than I was, <laughs> who called to let me know that unfortunately President Nixon had other plans that evening and was not going to be able to make the fundraiser. So I said, well, OK, but how about the vice president? Is he available? And there's dead silence on the phone. Uh, and this young staffer said, oh, no, I think the vice president's also busy. And I said, well, and this was the most important thing to me. I said, are they sending a check for the four tickets? And he said, absolutely, we'll send a check. And what they did is they sent two of the big checks that were signed by the president that we were able to present to both families in addition to the donation that they made uh, for the fundraiser. And uh, that uh, episode with my tickets and my letter are actually in the Nixon Library. <laughs> <laughs> that is wonderful. <laughs> yep. Oh, my goodness. So you started really being quite forward in networking and getting out there early on. Those those lessons learned through your family and these, you know, community activities are really remarkable. And so then how did this take you then after graduating from College of Holy Cross into the cable industry? Because you also moved very quickly there and you had a boss that took you out of your comfort zone even further. You know, I think uh, I think part of it is uh, I went to work when I was 12 years old. Uh, and if I wanted to buy things for me, I had to save my own money to do that. And so I grew up with a work ethic that you always put your head down, worked hard. Uh, you get paid for what you deliver. Uh, and then you can take that money and it gives you freedom and flexibility. So after I graduated college, I actually married my junior high school sweetheart. And he was an Air Force Academy grad and flew jets in the military. So we wound up stationed out in California. Mm -hmm. 
So I went from the East Coast, growing up in New Jersey, going to college in Massachusetts, and now all of a sudden, the weekend I got married, I, w- I moved to California, and I woke up, and here I was in this very strange location, uh, and I answered a job ad in the newspaper, because back then, that's how we got jobs, uh, for this new entrepreneurial company in Sacramento, California, which is where we lived, that was at this amazing intersection of software development and this fledgling new industry called cable television. And we provided management information systems and services, including billing, for the cable industry. I started as the accounts receivable supervisor there. And over a 12-year window, I wound up being uh, the leader of the U.S., European, and Canadian operations. And in the United States, I grew market share from probably about 15 to 20 percent to 85 percent in my tenure there, which through building relationships and networking and, um, and working uh, to deliver for customers and serve those customers' needs – Uh, really gave our company a competitive advantage in the industry. Mm -hmm. But you didn't have an engineering degree. No. You didn't have an MBA. No. It was your networking, your influencing, your sales, and your getting out there to the customer. Right. And delivering results consistently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So where did you go from there? So after I left cable data, uh, actually, Craig McCaw, who was in the cable industry originally, Uh, he and I got to know each other, and he was starting this new company called Cellular One, which was one of the first wireless operators for cell phones in the United States. And this was uh, in the early 90s, and I left cable data and went to work and ran the West region for Macaw Cellular, Cellular One. So I built the first cell phone networks in California, Arizona, Hawaii, New Mexico, and Nevada, and built uh, a great team of people. One of the things that I learned early on at both Cable Data and at Macaw is you're only as good as the people that work with and for you. And so I went after great athletes, people that I knew knew how to deliver results uh, that were were poor followers. They weren't going to just listen to what I said. They were going to challenge that and help me make better decisions. Uh, and collectively, uh, we grew uh, Cellular One to a very large company, uh, which AT&T wound up buying six and a half years later. And then I became the chief operating officer of AT&T Wireless, which I did for a couple of years before I pivoted to a startup in the San Francisco Bay Area. Which was called? Wink Communications. Mm-hmm. And it was in the interactive television space. Uh And I kind of equate that chapter of my career to the tale of two cities. It was the best of times and it was the worst of times. (laughs) Because when you come out of a company like an AT&T where it opens doors just because of the panache of the company you work for, I was now with this little startup that was backed by Benchmark Capital. Uh, I had to raise money. I had to take technology out of a lab. I had to build a team. Uh, And these were all things that I hadn't done before. And I've also been the type of person that will take calculated risks. Uh, And I think there are times in my career where I get out of my comfort zone and I do something totally different than my background has prepared me for. And they're the biggest high growth times in my career. And this was one of those. And I actually raised over $100 million with no CFO and no bankers based upon my relationships in the cable and telecom industry because the products I were developing were for that industry. Uh, I built the team. uh, I launched the product sets, uh, actually took the company public, one of a handful of women who had ever done that in the United States. We had a $2.5 billion market cap when we went public. Uh, And a couple of years later, I sold the company to John Malone's Liberty Media. So it was kind of a full circle from startup out of a lab all the way through selling the company after a public offering. Uh, And then after that, I went to work for Microsoft. Uh, I had the opportunity to get to know Bill Gates and Craig Mundy, who's the chief technology officer at Microsoft at the time. And based upon the relationship I had competing with Microsoft in the interactive television space with Wink, they had a product called Web TV. Uh, I was doing a lot better than they were in the marketplace. 
they called me right after we sold the company and asked if I would consider coming to Microsoft. I really wanted to go run another public company. Uh, and I was young. And, you know, I was in my early 40s. And uh, I went up out of respect to meet with Bill and Craig and to hear about what the opportunity would be. And the job was global business strategy for the company. And I would work directly for Bill. Uh, and I said I would be willing to do it for a year. Uh, because I really did want to go run another company. But I always felt that if I didn't take the opportunity to work with Bill Gates and Craig Mundy closely, it would have been a missed opportunity. Uh, I wound up staying two years. It was a great two years of my life. Actually taught me a lot about what to do when you scale and run big companies and also what you don't do. <laughs> and I think we always learn those lessons on both sides. Uh, and I also made sure that uh, I was the highest ranking woman at the time at Microsoft, that the person who took my place running not just global business strategy, but the worldwide public sector, which I took on, which was a $5 billion business for the company, uh, I made sure there was a woman right behind me that I could yank along and put into that job when I left the company. So I felt good about the tenure I had there. I still have very strong relationships uh, with, with Bill, with Greg Mundy, and a number of people uh, from Microsoft, including Jeff Rakes, who actually sits on the board of Costco with me today, and John Stanton, who worked with me at Macaw Cellular, who's on the Microsoft board. <laughs> so those relationships always come back and you reconnect. Uh, and then I went to Frontier for my 10 plus year run as CEO of that company. So be, by the time you're early 40s, you have been with small companies, you've been with large companies, you've been CEO of Wink, you take it public, you sell it, you go to Microsoft. Soft, and then you're ready to be CEO of another company, Frontier. Right. And it was a Fortune 1000 company at the time. Uh, and a, about $750 million in revenue when I joined, close, close to a billion the first quarter after I was there. And it was a sleepy rural telephone company. But coming out of Microsoft and running business strategy with, with Bill Gates at the time, I knew there was this new technology called the internet that was going to really revolutionize how we all communicated with each other. And I also knew that it would run on phone lines. So when I looked at the frontier opportunity, I looked through a lens of transforming the sleepy telephone company into an internet data video services company. Because my friends all thought I was crazy. Here was this company, it was strategically in trouble, nobody would buy it had a, a CEO shakeup. The CEO left the company. It um, really needed a turnaround. It did. It mm -hmm. was a turnaround situation and it had good bones though. Mm -hmm. And I knew the business. Uh, I knew a lot of the players on the board because I actually had sat on a subsidiary company of Frontiers called Electric Lightwave that was public uh, that we wound up selling back to Frontier uh, in one of the recessionary times when Telcom was totally overbuilt. So I had credibility with a number of the board members, and it was a great experience for me. I took the company from, as I said, about a billion in revenue to over 10 billion in revenue. Uh, I also transformed how we did business. Uh, we were very profitable. And when I left the company, the year I retired as CEO, we had an 85% total shareholder return, the highest in the telecom industry. And I really equate that to a couple things. One is when I came in, I was the only woman in a senior level position other than a, a VP of human resources in the top 500 people. And within a 24 month window, 50% of my operating leaders with PL responsibility were women, and 50% of my direct reports were women. I also transformed our board in the first two years. Uh, we replaced uh, 10 of the 12 board members. Uh, we wound up with uh, five women on the board. Uh, three people of color, and I wanted the board and my leadership to reflect the decision-making in the households and the small businesses and the medium-sized businesses that we served in our markets. And we were in about 20,000 communities in rural and suburban America. And through a number of acquisitions, uh, I actually grew that to about 40,000 communities. Uh, and I did 
close to $20 billion in acquisitions to really position Frontier as one of the top four leaders in telecom. Uh, And I wanted to give it runway and capability and scale for it to do well, not just do good. Uh, so it was a it was a great run for me. Uh, I stayed on a year as executive chair, uh, and then about three years ago, really pivoted to board work and advisory work. Maggie, you saw the need though to reflect your marketplace in terms of making your board and your direct reports in the company much more diverse. In terms of making that an important part of the business imperative. Why? Why was that so important in terms of changing that to reflect your marketplace? Because I felt that's the way you win. That's the way you grow revenue and profitability is by being aligned and being in touch with your customers and with your frontline employees. I've always run companies from what I call a left to right perspective. You start with the employee. If you take great care of your people, they in turn deliver amazing products and services and then customers pay you for that value. So it starts with people, it goes to product, and then it goes to profit. And I think when you run businesses from left to right and you're a servant leader to your employee base, you are making sure that the people that touch your customers every day are the right people with the right frame of mind, who do the right thing and know what's right for the company to be successful. I was also a very transparent CEO, despite all the lawyers around me telling me what I could say or not say, I trusted my employees. And I made sure that they knew what they had to have in their possession, both intellectually and from a product perspective, for them to do well and to do good for our customers. Uh, We were very active in our communities. Uh, I pushed decision-making down to the frontline level because that's where the rubber met the road. And I wanted us to be competitive in the marketplace and continue to change our products, our services, our performance in order to earn that trust every single day. Uh, And you can't sit on your laurels. You have to continue to change. And a lot of the ideas I got for change came from my front line, not necessarily from my leaders. And therefore, your shareholders benefited. Absolutely. So that's how it happened. And you know, what's very interesting is you took some very bold moves in the beginning. You got rid of the corporate jet. Yep. You got rid of the hangar, yep. you got rid of the, the pilots, the doctor, and then you gave the employees a raise that they had not had in five years. So yes. you really took care of your people and that engendered great loyalty to you. Yes. And I actually flew commercial the entire time I ran a Fortune 500 CEO. Very unusual. <laughs> yeah, it is unusual. Uh, but I felt it was the right thing. I also didn't have a pension and all my employees did. I had a 401k because I didn't want to have trappings around who I was. I wanted it to be, I wanted to be approachable with my employee base and it worked. You know, when you have a lot of long-term employees as, you know, Frontier was a 75 year old company when I went there. Generations work for that company. Uh, And, uh, you know, I had a lot of men that worked for me in the field, especially technicians. I had 65 union bargaining units. So I felt I had, to do what was right and approach all of my employees that they were employees of Frontier first, they were union members or anything else second, and I wanted to treat them with respect and reward them for performance. A remarkable career. You've been CEO, you've had multiple diverse boards, public and private. You've seen companies and boards evolve. What do you think is most needed today in leaders CEOs and board directors as they're leading these companies and the turbulent times we're in today? What do you think is needed? Well, I, I think it's uh, it's very different skills and capabilities uh, for a CEO to run a company versus a, a person to be a board member. I think there are certain qualities and qualifications that overlap for both of those jobs. But having the respect of someone who's the CEO of a company that really runs the day-to-day operations um, and is required for hiring all of the right people to work within that company, for being a steward of the values of that company, uh, of the customers, of the shareholders, lots of constituents, um, 
And then I look at the boards and, you know, boards today have a very different role than they did when I went on my first board at 28 years old. Uh, you know, boards are a lot more accountable. They have to be more transparent. They have to be broader in their skill sets and their decision-making capability. And they truly have to be more courageous. They have to have tenacity. They have to have grit. And they have to make tough calls. It's not ceremonial. It's real work, and it's rolling up your sleeves and doing what's right. And as a board member, we really have three jobs as a board member. We hire and fire the CEO. We set the strategy for the company, and we make sure the company is operating with good governance in the financial area, in the reputational area, in the cyber area, in all of those major risk areas where we have to have the right values and culture as well to set the table for doing what's good and what's right. Everything else is really the responsibility of a CEO. But boards only get together, usually in person, five times a year, especially on the public side. Private boards, usually it's four times a year. So as a board member, you you come and go from a, a sitting at a table with your peers. And remember, in, in the boards, no one's in charge. Everybody's an equal. So it's a very different dynamic than a hierarchy you have in a company. Everybody knows who's in charge. They know their bosses are. They know who the subordinates are. And I think when things go well in companies, it's easy for boards to do the work of the board without having a lot of what I would call tough discussions or uh, interactions that would bring diverse points of view uh, that some people might not necessarily bring up when things are good. And I think just like in anything else, you have to have muscle memory and build muscle to be strong, not just in good times, but to be strong and effective when things aren't good too. And so boards today, I believe, have to be challenging even in those good times. They can't give CEOs a pass. They can't say, okay, well, I'll just not say anything about that. I think we have to be a lot more out front on what is necessary and trust but verify on how companies are being run, how they're being led, how they're being governed. Uh, and that's very different than it used to be. And I also think it creates an environment where when a company does have a challenge, the board is already leaning in. They're not leaning back and have to learn how to lean in. Uh, and that makes a huge difference in a, in a time where every decision is made instantaneously in our lives. Well, you have been described, I mean, your career is so impressive. It's truly extraordinary. Um, and you're wanted at many boardroom tables and you've been on over 32 boards. So I've, I've read about you. I, I hear how you're described. It's as smart, strategic, intellectually curious, a great listener who pulls together the conversations of others to come up with the best solutions at the boardroom table. And you help others to be great board members. And as a CEO and director, you really cultivated relationships. You got on the plane to know your competitors and to build strong alliances. In doing deals, you didn't have hidden agendas. So you are a straight shooter. And because of that, you're trusted and deals get done and it's always a win-win situation. You really are the consummate networker. Everybody knows Maggie Wilderoy. <laughs> I mean, well, going back to the early days, you know, your, your career and how you worked with so many people, you were one of the few women in the telecommunications world. So everybody takes your calls and you help them and you help them solve problems. You're truly authentic. People want to do business with people who they like and trust, and that's you. So given all that you've learned and where boards are today and how they're evolving, what's your advice, particularly to those and particularly to women who are looking to get on their first board? Because you've been a big supporter of women. You made it a point of when you were on a board, and usually the first woman, to make sure that when you left that board, there were, was more than one woman on the board, right? You've been... Absolutely, absolutely. Because I, I was a trailblazer. It was an early time for women to get on boards. And once you get in a boardroom and you're a competent, capable woman, and I worked hard to make sure that I was always competent, capable, and prepared, you build trust with other members on the board. And 
what happens is your male counterparts see that, wow, women can add value. They bring a different perspective. They're helping us make better decisions. So I always had one hand out front of me moving myself forward. And I always had my other hand behind me yanking another woman along with me. And so I did. I put a lot of women on boards. Even today, I probably still play somewhere between 10 and 20 women a year on different boards because I get a lot of calls and I'm full up. But I always have a list of five other great women that I can say to whoever calls me, here are some terrific women that you should consider. Mm -hmm. And I would be happy to introduce you to them. Uh, I think, as you know, I've always uh, been... Uh, an outward advocate. I, I don't just talk about it. I do something about it. And I think a lot of women who have run Fortune 500s or in those C-suite positions, we're spending a lot of time focused on ourselves and our companies and not necessarily on helping others. And for me, um, it's a gift to help someone else, especially another woman move forward with their careers. I do a lot of career counseling with women. I have a lot of great women friends that I've had over the years and new ones. And I think that intellectual curiosity helps me to continue to learn from other women and other men. Mm -hmm. And and I think that balance is really important for being successful. And never thinking that you know it all. We never know enough. What we want to do is know and continue to grow and learn so we can continue to add that to our repertoire to make better decisions for ourselves and for others around us, uh, for the companies that we serve, whether in C-suite positions or on boards. Uh, and I think that's the most important thing to me as I think about what I do day in and day out from a, a career perspective. So you cultivated a lot of relationships along the way, which is partially, I think, and your talent and your achievements. So is that what women need to do more of to get on their board, you know, and to network better than they maybe have done to get on their boards? Yeah, I, th I think networking is working. That's how I always looked at it. It was just part of the job. Um, but it was also something I enjoyed. I love getting to know people because what makes people tick uh, is something that's a learning experience. It's like it's lifelong learning to me. People are the best source of learning. Uh, but I also think that women have to take responsibility and control for their own destinies. It's something I never relegated to anybody but me. You know, I had lots of mentors. Back then, we didn't call them that, and they didn't even know that's what they were doing. But they were giving me insights and information and help because I took the initiative to get that insight and information and to build trusted relationships where people could be candid and open to me. And I think women have to do that. There's no magic wand theory here of someone coming along and banging you on the head and saying, okay, you're now on a board. You have to be strategic about it. When I joined my first board at 28, I made a list of five companies that I wanted to go on the board of. I made a list of who the directors were, the CEOs, the senior leaders, and I would go where they were and I would meet them and I would build relationships slowly and quietly and do for others. That's what I do. I do that for a living in helping them be successful and in introducing them to others that could help them be successful and getting them comfortable with who I was. That's how I got on my first board. That's how I've gotten on every board because it really does matter for people to get to know you and for you to get to know others. Because the other thing about boards that is a little bit of a nuance for many is the culture of that board. And a company can be a great company, but if the culture is not aligned with who you are, it's very difficult for you to add value to that company. And I think kicking the tires of getting to know people on the board and people that are in leadership positions in companies are the right kind of diligence to do as much as what the financials look like, uh, what the opportunity set and the strategies are for that company. It's about who you're going to be in the foxhole with when things get tough. And you, you have to know that you're with a trusted group and you're with a group that will be tenacious and courageous and do the right thing. So get out there, get to know Absolutely. the company who's on that board, who's in the C-suite and, yes. and make sure that you do your homework and make it happen for yourselves. Right. right? And right. never take your eye off the ball of delivering results in right. your current job. Right. Now, Maggie, you are also an honorary co-chair of the Breakfast of Corporate Champions, which of the Women's Forum of New York, which I founded in 2011. This is your third year in 2019. You're doing this. So why is this important to you? 
Well, it's very important to me for a, a number of reasons. So since 2015, I've been an honorary co-chair. And this breakfast is a way to take women uh, and put them on the right stage. And what I mean by that is the Breakfast of Corporate Champions has seven, 800 directors of large companies sitting in the room and CEOs. And we're celebrating companies that have diversity on, on their boards, 25%, 40%. And this is the right way to recognize companies. Uh, and I think it's the right forum to have a discussion both in small groups at the tables, but also with the amazing panels, Janice, that you put together for that breakfast, for people to really say, wow, this matters. And I'll just give you a little anecdote to that. Uh, two years ago, when Dan Springer was a, br a brand new CEO at DocuSign, uh, I called Dan and I was a senior advisor to the company at the time. And I said, Dan, I would really like you to be my guest at the Breakfast of Corporate Champions in New York. And I told him about this breakfast. And he said, I'd love to come. So he came. He came to the CEO dinner the night before. He came to the Breakfast of Corporate Champions. And when he left that breakfast, he said to me, I'm going to transform my board. I want diversity on my board. And I want you to come on my board, Maggie. But I also want you to help me bring other women. So fast forward, it's now uh, about... A year and a half later since that breakfast, we have four women on the DocuSign board. We got three people of color and I'm chairman of the board. So this, you know, Dan Springer saw in what other CEOs were doing an opportunity to take his company and to transform the leadership at the board level. That is exactly what we want to have happen. So we want everybody to come to the November 7th, 2019 Breakfast of Corporate Champions at, at Cipriani 42nd Street, where Maggie, you will be again an honorary co-chair and you're going to be running your own panel. Yes. With Meg Whitman and Pat Russo. I know. So excited to tell the <laughs> HPE story with three right. great women. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I chair the audit committee at HPE. Of course, Meg was CEO and Pat's right. chairman of the board. So right. there's a lot of women power sitting around that board table too. So I'm looking forward to Maggie continuing continuing to do this with us until we get to parity by 2025. <laughs> yeah, or before. <laughs> or before, right. <laughs> so in closing, uh, I really, Maggie, I want to thank you so much for demonstrating that leadership reimagined and game-changing conversation, conversations are truly accelerating the pace of change for women in the boardrooms and in the C-suite. You are a remarkable leader, a remarkable friend, and a great supporter of women and executives uh, throughout corporate America. So thank you for all you're doing. And I want to thank our audience for tuning in for this remarkable conversation of reimagining CEO and board leadership with Maggie Wilderotter. So you can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, and visit our website at ellagroup.com. And stay tuned for more exciting episodes of Leadership Reimagined, Game-Changing Conversations. Maggie Wilderotter, thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Janice. It's a pleasure always to be with you. 